the Lord. Amen. Praise God. All right. First Peter chapter two, verse nine. The Bible says this. It says, but you are not like that for you are a chosen people. You are a, you are royal priests. A holy nation, God's very own possession. And as a result, you can show others the goodness of God, for he called you out of the darkness into his wonderful light. The Bible says in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 13, it says this. It says, so as David stood there among his brothers, Samuel took the flask of olive oil he had brought and anointed David with the oil. And the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David from that day on. Come on, let's pray this this evening. Amen. Father God, thank you for this day. Thank you for this time together. We love you. We honor you. We glorify your name, Lord. And God, I praise you right now for all that you're going to do, Lord. Father, I thank you, God, that you are in control right now, Lord. And I ask, God, that our hearts will be open to everything that you will, uh, that, that you have for us. Give us an ear to hear and a heart to receive, Lord. Not my words, but your words. Not my thoughts, but your thoughts, Father. Less of me and more of you, God. Father, if there's any obstacle that gets in our way from receiving, I pray that it would be removed in the name of Jesus. And I ask, God, that you would speak to our hearts. Break through in the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. And all of God's people said, amen. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. Today, I want to talk to you about being empowered. Everybody say empowered. Uh, I think it's very important for us to recognize that God empowers us for a reason. To be empowered means to receive power, to, to be empowered by something that, that's not of us. In other words, when I'm empowered by God, I'm empowered by something that doesn't originate in me. I, I do not have the capability to do the things that God has called me to do. I, I don't have the ability, I don't have the strength, I don't have the wisdom, I don't have the know-how. Uh, and to be honest, uh, if I try to do things on my own, and if you try to do things on your own, I know what's going to happen. We're going to mess up. Come on, somebody. Amen. Have you ever tried to fix a problem on your own only to make it more complicated? Amen. Only he's like, I'm going to try to help out here. And what's going to happen is I'm going to try to fix this. And you try to fix it and it ends up getting worse. Anybody ever been there? Amen. And so we understand this truth and we understand that, listen, we are flawed. We, we have our flaws. We have our limitations. And God knows that too. And so the verses that we just read talk about a people, talk about a people. Who, it says this in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. It says that you were called out of darkness. You were called out of darkness and into his marvelous light, one translation says. I think it's important for us to recognize that we're, we've been called out of things. We've been called out of an old way of thinking, an old way of living, an an old way of behaving. Come on. An old way of of, of acting, an old way of, of, of our old habits, all that stuff that's old in our life. God has called us out of that. Out of the pain of yesterday, out of the sorrow of yesterday, out of the shame of our history and our past, all those things, God calls us out of it. And I'm grateful to God that he calls us out of it because I don't want to be stuck in yesterday because my yesterday, if I can be honest with you, it's sorry. Come on, somebody. It's not a good thing. I'm not proud of things that I've done yesterday. You say, well, pastor, what did you do yesterday? I'm not going to tell you. Hey, come on, somebody. I ain't going to tell you what I did yesterday because you don't need to know, and I don't need to know what you did yesterday. But how many of you know that we all have a yesterday? We all have a past. And so it's from that past that God calls us out of. He doesn't, he doesn't, he doesn't leave us stuck there in the past. He doesn't leave, let us stay there in the past. He calls us out of something. But, but we need to know something. This is that if God calls us out of something, it's because he's calling us into something. He doesn't just call you out of something. He calls you out of something, not to leave you stuck in the middle, but he calls you out of something to move you forward. Amen. So so he doesn't pull you out of something just so that you can be, you know, in limbo, kind of just wondering, okay, what's next? He calls you out of something because he wants to put you into something else. He wants to move you forward. Everybody say forward. But how many of you know that you can't go forward if you're stuck in limbo? And see, there's that middle place, there's that, there's that place that's in the middle, like in between the, the, the past and the future, right? It, it, you can be stuck in the now, and you can be stuck in the middle, right? And we see this in the book of Exodus, when, when God's people were, were captive in, in Egypt. The Hebrew people had been captive in Egypt for over 400 years. 
How many remember seeing that movie, right? There's a movie, right? The Prince of Egypt, the animated movie, right? And, and, and they're in Egypt, and, and Moses sets them free, and he comes out. Well, it's a story of Moses and, the, and God's people, and he says, come out of Egypt. Why? Because they were slaves in Egypt. So he pulls them out of Egypt. And it's interesting to find out that the very same people who were eager, they were excited, they were enthusiastic, they couldn't wait to get out of Egypt. Now they're at the foot of the promised land, the, the land that God promises them. And what do they do? Now they're reluctant to go in, right? So they're happy to go out, right, and get out, but they're reluctant to step in. So in between you're getting out and you're coming in, there's something in the middle. And for them it was a, what I like to call a dilemma in the desert, right? Where do I go? What do I do? Do I go back to Egypt? Because on many occasions, watch this, on many occasions when trials came their way and, and, and adversity came their way, you want to know what they would say? They would say this, let me go back to Egypt. Let's go back to Egypt. You want to know why? Because check this out, although they were, they were physically out of Egypt, Egypt was still in them. See? Although they were physically in their bodies out of Egypt, whenever pressure came, guess what? What was in them would always come out. And what was in them? Egypt was in them. Watch. How many of you know that when you squeeze a, stu- a tube, a toothpaste, whatever's on the inside is going to come out? When I squeeze a, a tube of toothpaste, right? How many of you know that, that cheese whiz doesn't come out? That bean dip doesn't come out. Come on, somebody, right? That ranch doesn't come out. When I squeeze a tube of toothpaste, whatever's on the inside is going to come out. Watch, in your life when adversity comes and you begin to feel the pressure, whatever's on the inside is going to come out. And if all you want to do is go back to where you were at, back to what's comfortable, what happens is, is that's a sign for you that there's some stuff in your past that still needs to get, you get, need to get delivered from. You need to be set free from. See, your spirit may be saved, but your soul still has some ties to the past. You still have some habits that need to be broken. Some friendships that need to be severed. Come on, somebody. Are you, is anybody listening to me? Are you hearing me today? I, I need your help this, this evening. Amen. This is not the early service. You don't have to be quiet in here. Amen. All right. And so all of a sudden, you're, 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 there's a dilemma in the desert. And because they wouldn't go in and they couldn't go back, guess what? They were stuck in the sand. How many of you know that sometimes you get stuck in the sand when you don't know where to go? And so here they are. They're, God says, look, get out of Egypt, and I'm going to take you into the promised land. He, he set aside the promised land for them, but the promised land wasn't what they expected. Have you ever asked God for something, and then when God gave it to you, it wasn't what you expected? Huh? Like, like some of us, sometimes we pray these really, really bold prayers, and we're like, we're so happy that we pray them, right? Like, like God changed me. Lord, change me. And we're like, when we pray them, we feel so good about ourselves. Yeah, I, I prayed that God would change me. I'm so proud of myself. And then God starts to change you. Like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Right? Or how about, how about God use me? Like, I prayed that God would use me. And then all of a sudden, these opportunities to be used by God, they show themselves. I'm like, oh, not that. Come on. God prosper me. And then all of a sudden, all God wants to do is give you opportunities to sow seed and give. Like, whoa, whoa, hey. <laughs> they show up in the promised land. It's not what they're expecting. It's not what they're wanting, right? They wanted it to be a cakewalk. They wanted it to be a walk in the park. They wanted it just to be easy, breezy, and cheesy. Come on, somebody. <laughs> they just wanted it to be cool, right? But how many of you know that some of the things that God has for you, it's going to take some work. And although it takes work, God's already said it's yours. Come on. Although it's going to take some struggle, although it's going to take some sweat equity and some prayer equity and some faith equity and some obedience equity. In other words, although it's going to take some steps of faith, some steps of obedience, some steps of, 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 just, of just trusting in God, even though you don't understand. Although it's going to take all that, God already said it's yours. See? And so here God's people were. They were stuck in the sand. They were stuck in the sand. They, they couldn't go back and they couldn't go forward. So you want to know what they did? They wandered the desert. For 40 years, they wandered, and God said, listen, because you disobeyed me, you're not going to enter into the promised land. He goes, the generation behind you will, will, will take it. Now, hear me very carefully. God has blessings for you, but if you won't take them, he'll give them to somebody else. <laughs> he will. He has blessings for your family. He has blessings. More important, he has blessings for your life. But if, but if you're too scared, <laughs> you say, I ain't scared. <laughs> but if you're too scared... <laughs> If you're too afraid, if you're too timid, right? If you're too fearful 
to, to step into what God has for you. You want to know something? There's somebody behind you that will take it. Come on. There's somebody else that will take it. See, I believe that, that the Bible says that, that the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and, and the violent take it by force. In other words, the, in the spiritual realm, check this out. In the spiritual realm, God, there's things that we're going to have to aggressively pursue and take. That it's not, God's just not going to go, oh, you want it? Here it is. You know, the enemy's going to fight you. The enemy's going to resist you. The enemy's going to try to put things in your way to discourage you. All that is a, is, is, is a sign that you're doing the right thing. And so here God's people are. They're, they're stuck in the sand, and they don't know where to go. And how, you may be looking at me today and listening today and say, how do I know if I'm stuck in the sand? Well, let me give you just real quick just a way that you can tell if you're stuck in the sand. Check your attitude. I've never known anybody to be stuck in the sand and be happy. I've never heard anybody to be stuck in the sand and be joyful and optimistic. No, in fact, it's quite the contrary. When someone's stuck in the sand, you know what they are? They're critical. They're negative. They're complaining. They're whining. They whine, 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 whine. And you want, would anybody like some cheese with that whine? Anybody? Come on. <laughs> See what I'm saying? See, somebody just got that. See, it went like this. It went over your head, and then it came back. And like, ah, I see what you did there, Pastor. See, it took a while. Come on, somebody. Amen. <laughs> see, and so, so if you find yourself neg negative and critical and complaining about life and you're, you know, all these things and you're like, ah, oh, you're, you're upset and, and you're always cranky and moody and all this stuff. And you say, well, that's just the way I am. No, it's just it's, it's, that's where you're at in life. You're stuck in life. You can't go backwards and you can't go forward. You're stuck. But that's not God's fault. That's your fault. Because God doesn't want that for your life. He has a purpose for your life. He wants you to walk in the purposes of God, the plan of God, and the power of God so that you can possess every promise that he has for you. Amen? Amen. So I want us to get to David now. The Bible says in the verse that we just read, 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 13, it says, So as David stood there among his brothers, it says, Samuel took the flask of oil, and he had brought and anointed David with the oil. And the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David rather, from, excuse me, from that day on. And so, so we hear, see that David now, watch, he's, he's anointed. They, they come and they take a flask of oil. And they begin to pour the oil over his head. And that is symbolic of the Holy Spirit coming upon the individual. That is David being empowered. See, I want us to think about this. He calls David out of the pasture, the place where he's, he's watching sheep, because that's what he was doing. He, he calls him out of that place. And guess what he does? He calls him to a place now where he's going to be the next king of Israel. Now, he, he doesn't immediately become the king of Israel. It's a process, right? But it's in that day that he receives the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And let me tell you something. Just as David was anointed, I'm going to give you something that's going to blow your mind. Maybe you've never heard this before. Maybe you have. But do you know that now you and I can be anointed by God? That it's not, it's not just for David. It's not just for Jesus. It's for you and for me. And when I'm anointed, listen, that, that term anointed, it's a spiritual term means that I'm empowered by the Spirit of God. So you need to know that the reason, there are three reasons why God anoints you, all right? Three of many reasons. I'm just going to give you three today. But number one is because he anoints you because he wants to give you an assignment. Everybody say assignment. You have an assignment. You have an assignment. God has given you an assignment. If you're a parent today, your assignment is to be the best parent that you can be for your kid. If you're, if you're married today and you have a spouse, your assignment is to be a faithful and loyal and loving and caring and supportive spouse. That's what, the, that's what God wants you. That is your assignment. Don't come and say, well, pastor, I want to be a life group leader. I want, to, I, want to, I want to teach school discipleship. Can you start with your family? Can you start with your spouse? Come on, somebody. Can you, can you be good to them? Come on, right? Even, even in the New Testament, he says this. You want to be a leader in the church? Take care of your family. If you can't take care of your family, how are you going to take care of my people? Hello. You start with where you're at. Your assignment. See, sometimes here in church, we, we might ask you to do something. We say, hey, can you go, can you go fix the chairs in that room? You say, well, I'm above that. If, if, that's, if that's below you, can I, can I tell you you got an issue? See, because many of us were looking for the, for the platform, and God's saying, can you, can you go clean the bathrooms? Come on, somebody. Can you go help out there? Can, can you just greet people? Can you, can you help people, right? 
Well, I, I just have a calling. No, no. You, you know what you're called? You're called to help out in the nursery. You're called to. Now, I'm not saying that that's a bad place to start. I'm just saying is that, listen, let's serve where God start, wants us to start. You're hearing me today. Amen. And so, so, so David has an assignment. You have an assignment. You've been, you've been empowered to serve and to fulfill your assignment. And number two, I'm empowered. I'm anointed. Listen, because there's a divine purpose in my life. There's a purpose. Everybody say, I have a purpose. You have a purpose. There's a purpose in your life. There's a purpose in your life. And I want, I want to encourage you today that there's a purpose in your life. And God has a divine purpose for your life. And, and, and so, so many times the enemy wants to bring confusion. The enemy wants to bring, he wants to bring, you know, just an uncertainty to be insecure. He wants you. But here's, here's the fact is that there is a purpose for your life. And number three, check this out. God has a plan for your life. Everybody say God has a plan. Man, God has a plan for your life. The Bible says, the Bible says in John 10, 10, it says, he goes, I, my desire is to give you life and to have it more abundantly. God has a plan for your life. How many times have our plans clashed with God's plans? Like, you, you kind of have a feeling that God, you're like you're doing something, and you know that's not what God wants you to do. You know that that's not what God is asking of you. Are you hearing me today? You know that God's like, no, 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 that's not what I want for you. But you do it anyway. And then at the end of it, you're like, oh, man, why did I do that? And God, I just love God because God, I, I don't know. I don't know if you ever had this experience. But God really never tells me this. He's never told me this. I told you so. But he just stands there. I feel like he's like, mm-hmm. Mm. Are you ready, mijo? Are you ready, son? Okay, yes, God. Okay, let's go with your plan. Your plan's always best, Lord. How many, how many can say amen to that? Amen. So I'm anointed. Listen, I'm empowered because there's an assignment on my life. I'm empowered because there's a purpose on my life and, the, and because God has a plan for my life. Now, I want you to notice this, that when God calls you to do something, why am I saying this about David? Because he, he anointed him to be king. Whenever God calls you to do something, he will always empower you for it. He never asks you to do something that he won't empower you for. Please hear that. That is a very, very important point tonight is that God will never call you to do something and not empower you for it. If he calls you to do something, he's going to give you the power and the strength so that you can do it. Can I get an amen? Listen to this. I never find in scripture that when he called a prophet or he called a disciple or whatever, I never see in scripture where, where Jesus or the father speaking to the prophet or to people, he never said, can you? Can you do this? Can you do that? He never asked, can you? You want to know why? Because God already knows that you can't. God already knows that I can't either. He didn't say to me, hey, George, can you start a church for me? Hey, George, can you start a school of discipleship? Hey, George, can you run life groups? Hey, George, can you build a new? Because God already knows that I can't. And we never see in Scripture where God went to somebody and said, hey, can you? Now, what he did ask was, will you? See, that's different. Because now it has to do with your will and not your ability. See, God's, God's not moved by your ability. God doesn't move because you have the ability to do something. He moves when you have the willingness to do it. Amen? Because watch, he wants you to say yes. And when you say yes, guess what happens? God says, you said yes? Okay, now I can use you. Now I can. I, he doesn't want you to say, I can do it, Lord, because then it's you who can do it. But he wants you to say, Lord, I will do it. See? And so, so God is not looking for those who can. In fact, those who say they can, God says, I'm not using them. You want to know why? Because when you go to the Lord and say, I can, you know what you're saying? Is that you have the ability to do it. You know what that is? That's pride. And you want to know what comes before the fall? Pride. And people say, I can do this and I can do this. And they never do it. You want to know why? Because you really can't do it. Look at your neighbor and say, you can't do it. Come on, say that. You can't do it. And that's not a slam. That's not a slam. I'm not... I'm not trying to slam you. I'm not trying to, you, oh, man, Pastor, you, you're making me feel bad. No, no, don't feel bad because none of us can do it. But you want to know what God is looking for? He's looking for those who can say, okay, Lord, I will. Here am I, Lord. Here am I. Come on. 
And so God never asks, can you? He always asks, will you? Will you obey me? Will you trust me? Will you have faith in me? Will you believe me? Will you take that step of faith? Will you let me work through you? Will you die to self? Will you make that sacrifice? Will you, will you dream big? Will you let me work through you? He, it's all he's asking for tonight is will you? Because the moment you say yes, what you are saying to the Lord is, Lord, I give you permission to empower me. That, Father, that through my weakness, your name is going to be glorified. See? It's in, it's, in, it's in our weakness, the scripture says, that his strength is made perfect. Check that out. Listen to that. It's in our weakness. It's in our inability. It's in, it's in us saying, I can't, that God's strength is in manifested in our life. Watch, so that I, then I can do it. Come on. He does it through me. See? So, so please, if you're here today and you feel like, like for instance, like, like we talk about life groups. We say, hey, there's people in this room, I believe right now, that this is a, a true statement I'm making. There are people in this room right now that, you can, you, that God is calling you, listen, to lead a life group. And you're going, I can't do it. God is calling you to go to the school of discipleship. I can't do it. God is asking you to give more than you've ever given before. I can't do it. He's asking you to pray like you've never prayed before. He's asking you to take a step of faith like you've never done it before. And you're looking at me and you go, I can't do it. Good. Then God can do it through you. So that's the truth. God's not looking for your can. He's looking for your will. And so here David, David's minding his own business. And what is he doing? He's like, here I am. All right. And he goes to the, he goes to the prophet Samuel. And Samuel says, this is the one. And they take the anointing. They take the oil. They take the flask. And they begin to pour that oil over David. Watch this. And now all of a sudden, come on, the doors begin to open for him to be the next king. You see, could it be, listen, could it be that there are doors that haven't opened yet because you haven't been, you haven't, you haven't allowed the Holy Spirit to empower you yet? Because if those doors were to open, you want to know something, you'd be overwhelmed and you'd crash and burn. And God's saying, I can't open those doors until you allow me to empower you. See? And so there you are. God, open doors, open doors, open doors, open doors. God, open doors, open doors. Lord, send me to the nations. Lord, send me. And like, uh, God's like, let me empower you just to go to the next, neighbor, next door neighbor. Come on, somebody. Lord, Lord, help me win all my family for Jesus. Hold up now. Let me work in your life first. Ask me to empower you. All those things are good. But what I'm saying is, is allow God to work through you. See, in the Old Testament... We find that there were three, three individuals, three types of people that were anointed. It was the priests, the kings, and the prophets. There were three people, only three people, not anybody, just anybody was anointed in the Old Testament. There were only three people. It was the priests, the kings, and the prophets. The priests, the Bible says in Leviticus chapter 8, verse 12, it says that Aaron, the high priest, was anointed. All the priests were always anointed. They were separated. They were empowered to do the work of God. The kings, right? First, uh, First Samuel chapter 10 says this, it says, and Samuel took the olive flask the, or the flask of olive oil and he poured it over Saul and Saul became king. So the priests were anointed, the kings were anointed, and the last group of people that were anointed were the prophets. First Kings chapter 19 verse 16 says that God told Elijah, Elijah, excuse me, and he says, Elijah, take the oil and pour it over Elisha, he's your successor. So who, who were anointed? Priests, kings, and prophets. Now this is really important. Why? Because it gives us a glimpse as to what we're called to do. Because listen to this. I want us to look at first the priest, all right? I, you need to know this is that is the priest was, was called to, to be a servant. So, so I am anointed to be a servant. I am anointed to be a servant. Listen to this. The book of uh, Mark chapter 10, verse 45, it's not on the screen, but listen to what it says. Jesus said this. Jesus said, I have not come to be served, but I've come to serve. See, we are never more like Christ than when we serve. God is asking you to serve. See, I think it's important for you to come to church. Can I get an amen? I think it's important for you to come and hear the word. I think it's important for you to worship. I think it's important for you to come to the altar and sing and shout and dance and whatever it is that you, you know, God puts in your heart to do. I think it's important for you to sit and learn. But can I tell you something? I think it's important for you to serve. Come on. It's important for you to serve. You can't come to church and just sit. That's not what God called you for. 
Somewhere, sometime, you're going to have to start to serve. And you're like, well, I've only been here 10 years, Pastor. I'm waiting for my moment. <laughs> Come on, somebody. I've only been here a couple of months, and oh, we, we get that. But there comes a moment when it's time to serve. It's time to get connected. It's time to get plugged in. Shameless plug. It starts with connections class. Come on. So, well, I've been saved all my life, and I never went to connections class in any church that I went to. I don't need it. If you don't, you know, you want to know what that is? That's a rebellious spirit. What? Yeah, it's a rebellious spirit. Because in this house, this is the way we do things. And if you want to you connect to this house and you want to serve in this house, well, you're going to go by the rules of this house, right? Right, when I, watch, when I go, when I go to, um, I'm trying to think whose house I've gone to. When I go to Oscar's house, I've gone to Brother Oscar's house, and I walk into Brother Oscar's house, and guess what? When I walk into Brother Oscar's house, guess what I see right there by the door? I see all the shoes right there by the door. So you want to know what I do? I take off my shoes because in his house, those are his rules. Now he says, no, pastor, you don't have to do that. No, no, no. Those are your rules. I'm going to take off my shoes, but I don't want you to complain that my feet smell. Come on, somebody. (laughs) Come on, somebody. Yesterday, we're having our life group, and, and he was saying, in my house, when I'm driving in my vehicle and someone gets in my vehicle, guess what? You're going to listen to Christian radio. You're going to listen to praise and worship. You're going to listen to teachings. They, they come in, and they want to change the dial, and, and, and Oscar gives them the look. Come on, somebody. And he pulls out the machete, and papa. No, I'm playing. I'm joking, all right? Why? Because, because in, that, in his house, in his car, it's his rules. In this house, come on, you want to serve, you're going to go by our process. Right? The Bible says, know that labor those, know that, know those that labor among you. How are we going to know you? How are you going to know us? Well, our connections class. But you've been called to serve. You've been anointed to serve. See? 2 Corinthians says this, chapter 5, verse 18. In fact, if you have it there in your Bible, I want to read this because I think this is so important. This is, this is who we've been, what we've been called to serve or who we've been called to serve. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18 and 19, check this out. The Apostle Paul writes this, and he says, he says this, and, and, and all of this is a gift from God. What is a gift from God? What the previous verse says, that old things have passed away and everything's been made new. How many of you know that's a gift, amen? That the old person has, been, has gone and the new person has come alive in Christ. That's a gift. And he says, this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ. And God has given us the task or the assignment, come on, or the job or the duty of reconciling people or the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them and having them, listen, he goes on to say, for God who was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. And he gave us this wonderful message. Another translation says that he gave us this wonderful ministry of reconciliation. So watch, I've been called to serve God and to serve people. So watch, and when I come here to church on Sunday, I'm not just serving God, I'm serving people. Watch, when you're in the nursery, when you're in kids' church, when you're in the cafe, when you're ushering or greeting, you're on the worship team, you're not just serving God, you're serving people. When I'm preaching, I'm, what I'm doing is I'm operating in the, in the message or the ministry of reconciliation. What is this message trying to accomplish? I'm trying to take the broken people, people who are broken, people who are hurting, people who are lost, people who are depressed, people who are under stress and and, and suffering depression. I'm trying to take those individuals and I'm trying to take them and lead them, not to myself because I can't change them. I can't help them. I'm trying to get them and take them and connect them to reconcile them with the Lord. That's That's what the ministry of reconciliation is. How many of you have friends, co-workers, family members, come on, neighbors, people that you know that are far away from the Lord, that they're hurting, they're broken, and they're, they've been battered by life, and they're depressed, and they're stressed out? You know those people. Can I tell you something? That you're anointed to take those people and lead them to Christ. Well, I don't know if I can do it. You can't. Uh, we've, already, we've already established that. The, the issue is that you can't, right? The issue is... Will you? Will you allow God to work through you? Will will you allow God to empower you so that that task can be accomplished? And so we've been been called to reconcile people with God. How many of you know that people, people don't need you to tell them how bad they are? Right? No one needs to tell you how bad you are. 
Luke. You want to know why? Because you already know how bad you are. Come on. And I'm not talking about the good kind of bad. You know, like when you look at yourself in the mirror after a workout, and you go, that's right, I'm bad. <laughs> not that bad. I'm talking about the bad that makes you feel guilty at night. The bad that, that brings shame upon your life. The bad that makes you feel miserable. The bad that, that makes you feel like you're not worthy of God's love. That's the bad I'm talking about. People don't need you to, to tell them how bad they are. They already know. Besides, if you went around telling people how bad they are, that's not the ministry of reconciliation. That's the ministry of separation. Come on, somebody. That's the, that's the, and I don't even call that a ministry. That's, that's, a, that's a heart of condemnation. You're condemning people. You're pushing them away. See, so you and I, listen, we, we've been anointed to serve. How? To help people find God. We help people find God, not because we're perfect, but because God chooses imperfect vessels, imperfect people, so that at the end of the day, you and I don't get the glory he does. See, I'm not only anointed, check this out, to serve, but I'm anointed, listen, I'm anointed to lead. See, the Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 2, it says that you're a priest, in other words, you're a servant, but he says that you're a royal priesthood. In other words, you're royalty. Look at, look at your friend right there next to you and say, you're royalty. Come on, say that. You're royalty. Come on. Some of you, some of you, you're saying that. You're saying it like a question. You're like, you're royalty? Really? For real? Wow. Wow. Come on. It's because you don't know. You don't know that I'm royalty because... Because I haven't got my crown yet. But one day I will. Come on. When I get to heaven one day, I'm getting the crown up there. And watch, I'm going to get my crown. I'm going to go, look what I got. Come on, somebody. Amen. We're going to do it with a holy attitude too. Come on. Amen. Your royalty. In other words, and whenever you see royalty, listen, there's authority. And whenever there's authority, there's leadership. Have you ever, have you ever had a job or been in a, in a workplace where somebody had the title, but they lacked the authority? right? They had the title, but, but you're in a, like in a staff meeting and the manager who, who has the position has the position, but really doesn't have the authority. But somebody else who's been there longer and works harder and everybody has their respect because that person doesn't lord over that position over people. He doesn't say, well, I've been here. The See, if you have to tell somebody you're the leader, you're not the leader. If you have to remind people, hey, 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 I'm the leader. You are not the leader. So you're in that meeting, right? And all of a sudden they're saying, well, this is what we're going to do. And they don't look to the manager. They look to the person with the most authority in the room. And they're like, okay, what does this person think? And they're waiting for that person to approve. And like, okay, we're going to do it. Not because the manager said, but because the leader said. Watch. If, if you're pursuing, listen, if you're pursuing, pursuing a position, listen, if you're pursuing a position, you, you've got it all wrong. you got it all wrong. Right? See, see, a lot of people, we were at a conference this week with some pastors, and, and I love what one of the pastors said. He said something to the younger generation. He says, quit pursuing, listen, quit pursuing the position of your elders. He says, pursue their heart. Pursue their anointing. Pursue their passion. Try to let that rub off on you. See, you're royalty. You're, you're, God's called you to be a leader. He's given you authority. He says, all authority has been given unto me, and now I'm giving it to you. Go and make disciples. He said that in Matthew 19 and 20. So check this out. You're anointed to be a leader. The function of a king was to lead God's people. God has, God has a call on us to be a leader and not just mere followers. There's a verse in the Old Testament that says this, that God called you to be the head and not the tail. In other words, he wants you to go up front, not behind. Amen. See, I like what Oral Roberts He's a great evangelist in the, in the, in the 1900s, in the, in the mid to, to late 1900s. And he, he would have these crusades in, in tent revivals and people would get healed and saved. And Or Robert said this one time. He said, any old dead fish can swim downstream, but it takes, it takes a, a, a live one to swim upstream. See, it doesn't take much. You don't have to lead fish downstream, but it, it, you got to be one of those that are swimming against the, the current, against the flow. See, right now we got a lot of people that are just going with the flow. It's going with the flow in our culture, going with the flow in our society. Well, this is what everybody's saying, and this is how everybody's changing, and this is how, what everybody says in the culture, and this is what's popular. God didn't call you and me to go along with what's popular. He called us to be leaders. 
And sometimes leading means going against the flow. I, I love what's going on in our school of discipleship on Wednesday nights. I love what's going on because not only are we making disciples, can I tell you what's happening is we're building leaders. We're building leaders. I gave this example in, in our second service. I believe it was in our second service this morning. You know, when we started our first uh, season of discipleship, school discipleship, you know, I, t- I came to Zach and Dre, our, our youth leaders, because on Wednesday nights, our young people, after praise and worship, they used to go to the fellowship hall, and they would have their own little Bible study over there, and they had their time. And I came to Zach and Drea, and I said, Zach and Drea, I said, look, I, I want the young people, right? I want the young people to come into the school discipleship with us. And you know what? They agreed. And, yeah, we'll do that, Pastor. That's awesome. They were excited about it, but our young people weren't. <laughs> they weren't. I remember, I, I say, Pastor, how do you know that? Because the, my kids, <laughs> come on, somebody. I know, I, my kids, three of them were in the, young, in the youth group. And it was my kids. And I, and I know my, my little Georgianne's over here, my, my 12-year-old Georgianne over here. She's over here. And I know that she wasn't happy about it because she came to me and she says, we're going to have to go into the sanctuary. And I go, yeah. And, and, and what did she do? She went, <sighs> That's the look I'm doing. That's the look she gave me. <laughs> Sigh. <sighs> that wasn't an indecipherable sound in the Holy Spirit. <laughs> that wasn't her speaking in, in the Spirit. That was the flesh going, I don't like this. <laughs> Come on, Georgian. Come on, you know it's true. Don't shout me down, sister. Come on, amen. <laughs> and so they came. Our young people came, right? And, and they came a little reluctantly, right? But after the third or fourth week, guess what? They were all into it. And they were up here at the altar, and they're jumping, they're shouting. And you know what I love about, about our school discipleship is that on a Wednesday night, on any, and, and in any service as well, it's, it's carried over to our services, is that you'll have somebody who's 50 years old, 45 years old, 40 years old, 35, and you'll get a 12-year-old standing next to them. And the 12-year-old is worshiping, and the 20-year-old is worshiping, and the 30-year-old is worshiping, and the 40-year-old is worshiping, and the 50-year-old is worshiping, and the, everybody above that is worshiping. Come on, somebody. It's like all generations. And you know what's happened? Is that the school discipleship is, is teaching our people to lead at all levels, from the oldest to the youngest. And that's why I, I want to brag on our young people for just a moment. That's why we have four young people right now that are considering, that are going to be going to a, 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 a conference this coming Saturday, come on, so they can learn how to start a Bible club in their school. Come on. You know what they're saying? You know what that, you know what that tells me? is that they're tired of following, that they're ready to lead. They're like, we're ready to take this campus for Jesus. We're ready to bring some hope. We're ready to, we're ready to bring, bring a light. That's leadership. Come on. While others are, 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 you know, suffocating in, in, in Instagram and, 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 and drowning in Facebook and Snapchat. Come on, we got some people, young people, who are saying, God, use me so that I can be a light on my campus. That's exciting. They're anointed. Our young people are anointed to do this. And then finally, check this out. You're anointed to be a voice. First, first Peter chapter 2, verse 9. It says this one more time at the very end of the scripture. It says this. It says that God has has called us to be a royal priesthood. It says a holy nation, God's very own possession. And as a result, you can show others the goodness of God. Another translation says he's called you to declare the praises of God. In other words, he's called you to declare, to be a voice. You got to be a voice. Amen you got to be a voice. You see, I believe that today, I believe that today God's calling you to be a voice. The function of a prophet was to be a voice, to be the voice of God. God empowers us to be a bold voice. I'm going to say something today. A lot of the stuff that I say up here at the altar sometimes, in 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 the stage or the platform or on a Sunday morning, there's times where I go, Lord, do you really want me to say that? God, I really don't want to say that. I don't want, yeah, I'm serious. Like, God, this is going to be heavy. Like, when I get up here and I say, hey, are you struggling because of your own bad decisions? (laughs) That's not popular. 
For me to say to somebody, hey, guess what? Without Jesus, you're lost. What does that mean? That means that if you die without Jesus, come on, you're separated from, from God for an eternity in a place called hell. Hell is not a popular subject. There's times when I talk about real, really pointed things. You know, in our school discipleship, again, we talk about sexual purity. You know, that's it. That's not, a lot of people don't want to hear about that. I mean, it's amazing. We talk about that. Everybody starts squirming. <laughs> because it's hard. Because you're talking about real issues. And it's not easy. But can I tell you something? It's not about saying the easy and the comfortable things. It's about saying the right things. See? It's like, look, none of us in here are without sin. So when I address these issues, it's not because I'm going to look at you and look at you and look at you. And, and, and here's the fact. You know what? Your opinions won't change anybody. Can I tell you something? Your opinions really don't matter. My opinions don't matter. That, hey, what do you think about the borders? It doesn't matter. What do you think about the environment? It really doesn't matter. What do you think about politics? It really doesn't matter. Come on, somebody. You want to know why? Because those issues, you know what they do? They don't unite us. They separate us. And so watch, if I tell you, and you say, well, do you have an opinion? I do have an opinion on those things. What is it? I ain't going to tell you. You want to know why? Because it's none of your business. Well, how do, you, how do you know, that? how can I know that you have one? Why do you want to know my opinion? I have one, you have one, but is it going to change anybody? What I think about the glaciers up north and what I think about the borders to the south and what I think about the ozone layer or what I think about, what, that's not going to save anybody. So God didn't call us to share our opinions. And I'm not saying that you can't have a discussion with your friends and family about these things. But ultimately, is it going to do any good for their soul? But I'll tell you what God did call us to be, and that was a voice to share the good news. You see, Jesus, Jesus already knew our excuse because most of the time when, when we tell people, hey, invite someone to church or share your faith with somebody, you want to know the number one response that most people get is this one. I can't do it. I don't know what to say. I don't know what to say. It's like if we, if we came to a prayer meeting, okay, let's just, let, let me diffuse this. Let me, let me make this very simple. Many of you don't come to Saturday morning prayer, prayer power, and that's okay. Watch, you don't come because you're afraid that you may have to pray out loud in front of people. I've been there. I've been there. We're like, oh, what am I going to say? What am I going to say? Here's, here's what I would tell you, is that Luke 12, 12 says this. It says that there will come a moment in your life, watch, when people will want you to say something about your faith, and you're like, I don't know what to say, but Jesus said this in Luke 12, 12. He goes, but when that time comes, the Holy Spirit will tell you what to say. It will. Like, how many have been so nervous, and you're like, you want to tell your friend, you want to tell your coworker, you, you want to you tell them, but you just don't know what to say. I've been there, right? And God takes you where you're at. And it's not about what you can do. It's about what you're willing to do. And he'll take you and he'll grow you and mature you. I use one of our guys as an example. You know, a couple years ago, almost three, about two and a half years ago, I started meeting with a group of men, right, on Saturday mornings. we just get together to pray and talk. And in that group, there was a young man that would come and, and join us for prayer and, and breakfast. Zach, Brother Zach. He'd come and he'd sit there. Zach you know, he was soft-spoken. He wouldn't say very much. Uh, Zach, all he would do is he would nod a lot. Right? He'd nod. He had muscles, but he'd nod. He'd like muscles, nodding, flexing and nodding. Then I'd say, I'd say, hey, then I'd say, hey, Zach. Zach. I don't know why that's funny. I'm just saying. Like, like, like he, was, he was sitting there and he, he would pray. And I'd say, Zach, can you pray? Pray. And, and Zach would pray. And he would be like, but that was a sincere prayer I'm not making fun of him that's where he was at and those sincere prayers like that God listens to that and now he comes on Saturday morning two and a half years later and I'm like hey Zach uh, Zach uh, pray 
And Zach just got, hey God, we come to you in the name of Jesus. And we're in, and we're like, hey God, we take authority. And Lord, we bind the devils. Hey God, and I'm like, and I'm sitting there over here like a like a, a proud spiritual father. I'm like, that's right, devil. He got you ain't got that one right there in Jesus' name. And all he's like pray. See, you wanna know why? Because he's he's found his voice. And that's my desire for each and every one of you. That you would find your voice. That the enemy has told you you don't have a voice. The devil is a liar. You have a voice. You want to know why? You want to know why you have a voice? Because your kid needs to hear that voice. Your son and your daughter need to hear that voice. The young people need to hear that voice. This generation needs to hear that voice. Are you hearing me today? They need to see you. They need to see you cry out to God. They need to see you preach the gospel. They need to see you, you know, lift up your voice in praise. They need to see you. What blessed me tonight, earlier today, in the service, in the, earlier just a while ago, was when, when I saw Haley over here and Delia over here, right? And they were going at it in prayer and worship, and they were moving. And I, and I looked, and I looked over here, and Bella, right? Bella was over here looking at him like, But, the, but, then, but then she like has her hands up like like this like I don't know what this is but it must be good because she wasn't moving she wasn't distracted she was engulfed because why because there was two young ladies that found their voice see now if I were to go to Delia and ask her hey Delia do you have struggles I know she didn't tell me yes hey Delia do you have your downs and your ups and downs? I know, I already know the answer to that. But you know what I love about this young lady? Is that in spite of her struggles, guess what? Those struggles haven't drowned out her voice. And it doesn't have to drown out your voice either. See? Man, I love the third service at night because I really let go. I let go at night, I do. I was telling Brother James, Brother James and I went to San Diego this week and, and just for a couple of, uh, like a day, and, and, and he said, Pastor, which is your favorite service? And I said, you want to know the truth? Honestly, I said, I, I, I like our Sunday night service a lot. And, he, and I said, and then I said, but I also love our school discipleship. It's amazing. But Sunday night, because you want to know why I like Sunday night service? It's because I, this is the third time I preach this and every time it gets better. <laughs> like, I, I go home and I think about what did I miss? What did I? And I'm like, okay, I'm gonna say that tonight. And I say, God, this is it. Like it gets better. It's like how many of you are Latinos in here, and how many of you know that when you eat menudo and you reheat it, it tastes better, right? Right. That's what they say. I don't like menudo, right? But they say when you reheat it, it's better. This this message has been simmering the third time around. Amen. I'm gonna I'm gonna close with this. I know I've said I'm closing. I, I think it's the first time I said it, but the the keyboard player came up, right? And so. Maybe that was a sign for me to wrap it up. Come on. Check this out. Do you know that in the Old Testament, there was one, only one person who was a priest, a king, and a prophet? In the Old Testament, there was only one person, and his name was David. David functioned like a king, like a priest, and a prophet. Check this out. He was a king because he was anointed king. We know that he was a king. He was a priest because he brought the tabernacle. He brought the... He brought the, the Ark of the Covenant, the presence of God, back to the temple. And he worshiped God. He worshiped God as if, as if he had that intimacy that only a priest had in those days. Only a priest could be in the presence of God. But David worshiped before the Lord. So he had access to God like a priest. But do you know that David was also a prophet? In other words, he was a prophet because when he ran into Goliath, come on. You want, to know, you want to know what he said to Goliath? He said, this day, you're going to die. This day, I'm going to kill you. This day, I hope there's no kids in here. Cover your ears. This day, I'm going to cut off your head. That's what he said. He was prophesying it. He said, this day isn't going to finish without you being dead. Come on. And guess what happened? He did the job. Do you know that in the, in the New Testament... There was one man as well that was a priest, a king, and a prophet. You want to know who that was? It was Jesus. In fact, do you know that when you find Jesus at the cross, he functions as a priest, a king, and a prophet? 
at the cross, he, he functions as a priest, a king, and a prophet. Listen, how does he function as a priest? Because he took your sin and my sin and he put it on himself. Why? So that he can reconcile us with God. He becomes a priest. He serves us. How is he a, how is he a king? Because while he's on the cross, he looks up to the Father and he says this to the Father. He says, Lord, forgive them. He did not ask God to forgive them. He didn't say, God, if you want to forgive them. He says, God, forgive them. Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. See, only a king had the authority to forgive. So he tells the Father, as a representative of the Father here on earth, Jesus the Son tells God the Father, and he says, I need you to forgive them. He wasn't only speaking about the people there. I believe he was speaking about all of us. So uh, he functions as a king. But he also functions as a prophet. How does he function as a prophet on the cross? Because when he was on the cross, there was a criminal next to him. And he looked over at the criminal and he said to the criminal, a criminal who didn't deserve it, a criminal who had lived a bad life, but who begged for God's mercy. And he said to him, today you will be with me in paradise. He was prophesying it. Let me ask you a question. What is God prophesying over you tonight? What is he prophesying over you? What is he declaring over you? See, that's really the most important thing. What is he saying about your work week? What is he saying that you're going to accomplish? What is he saying that he wants to do in your life? I want to speak to our young people. Some of you are headed back to college this week. In the coming weeks, some of we have students in high school that are already back. What is God declaring over your school year? Parents, what is God declaring over your family? Husbands and wives, what is he declaring over your, your marriage?